Our Father, we come to you this evening just thankful, Father, for, for another opportunity to gather as your people, to hear your word, to be reminded of who you are and of all that you've done for us. Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. And so I pray that you would just bless us this evening as we study, as we think and meditate on your scriptures, Lord, as we fellowship together, um, as we pray to you. Lord, I thank you for this body, and I pray that you would be with those who can't make it with us tonight, those who are dealing with sickness or just various situations. I pray that you would just be with all of your people and bring us all together on the Lord's Day. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen, amen. Well, I'm going to go ahead and read our passage for tonight. It is Psalm 90, starting in verse 1. This is the word of God. A prayer of Moses, the man of God. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You return man to dust and say, Return, O children of man. For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. You sweep them away as with a flood. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. For we are brought to an end by your anger. By your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins, in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone, and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? So teach us to number our days, that we may get a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, and for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants, and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. This is the reading of God's word. And so as we begin tonight in Psalm chapter 90, the first thing we might notice is the preface before verse 1, which identifies Moses as the author of this psalm. And all God's people said, huh? What? Moses? Not David? What? Right? Yep, yep. It's true. Of the 150 psalms, Moses is the author of one, which is very interesting considering almost all the rest of the psalms were penned during the era of King David, centuries after Moses lived. So it's a unique psalm, Psalm 90. Those who arranged the Psalter did so strategically and embedded this beautiful poetic writing of the ancient Moses right in the beginning of book four of the Psalms. And this means the context in our minds is not the typical life and ministry and experiences of David during Israel's political dominance and success during the Davidic era. To get the context of Psalm 90, we actually need to import ourselves back into those desert wandering days the days of Moses, those tiresome, fearful, insecure days of the infant nation of Israel as they're just beginning to to get started. Remember, God had miraculously delivered those descendants of Abraham out of a 400-year enslavement 
to Pharaoh in Egypt. God covenanted with them at Mount Sinai, officially establishing them as his holy nation and royal priesthood. God gave them his laws and promised to be their God and that they would be his people and that he would lead them into the promised land, right? And all of this was fine and good except for the fact that the people were utterly sinful throughout the entire journey, right? Completely sinful and ungrateful and disobedient throughout this journey. There are many places we could go to get a quick taste of the days of Moses throughout the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, but I want us to to read a passage from Numbers chapter 14. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Numbers 14. This will help us kind of set the context, the stage for us as we approach Psalm 90. These are the days of Moses. Remember, Moses had sent his spies into the promised land of Canaan, right? And they brought back a mostly fearful and negative report, saying the people there were terrifying giants, right? They, they will never conquer that place. The people are too big and too strong, the spies said, right? Yet you had Caleb and Joshua, however, they gave a positive report, trusting the promises of God, fully believing that they could conquer the land, but the, the congregation didn't want to hear that, right? They were, they were terrified, and they start grumbling against God and against Moses, saying, we should have never come out here. We might as well just stayed in Egypt. Imagine being that ungrateful <laughs> to be delivered in the Exodus and then get to this point and in fear say, I wish I was back in Egypt, right? This is what we're dealing with in the days of Moses. And then we read in Numbers 14, starting in verse 26. I'm going to read a few verses here. Numbers 14, starting in verse 26. And the Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron, saying, how long shall this wicked congregation grumble against me? I have heard the grumblings of the people of Israel, which they grumble against me. Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord, what you have said in my hearing, I will do to you. Your dead bodies shall fall in this wilderness, and of all your number listed in the census from 20 years old and upward, who have grumbled against me, not one shall come into the land where I swore that I would make you dwell, except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. But your little ones, who you said would become a prey, I will bring in, and they shall know the land that you have rejected. But as for you, your dead bodies shall fall in this wilderness. We see that phrase twice. And your children shall be shepherds in the wilderness 40 years and shall suffer for your faithlessness until the last of your dead bodies lies in the wilderness. This is the third time. According to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, 40 days, a year for each day, you shall bear your iniquity 40 years and you shall know my displeasure. I, the Lord, have spoken. Surely this will I do to all this wicked congregation who are gathered together against me. In this wilderness they shall come to a full end, and there they shall die. I don't think God could be more clear about what's going to happen to this wicked generation. Verse 36, And the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land, who returned and made all the congregation grumble against him by bringing up a bad report about the land, the men who brought up a bad report of the land died by plague before the Lord. Of those men who went to spy out the land, only Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, remained alive. So, these are the days of Moses. These are the sorts of things that are happening in the days of Moses. This was the sort of rebellion and sin that God was punishing among the people of Israel in those dreary, wearisome days in the desert. Sin is running rampant. God is putting people to death in the wilderness. 
And these were the days in which Moses would have written a chapter like Psalm 90. Psalm chapter 90, right? Let, so we need this context, this context of sin and rebellion and, and seeming hopelessness to shape our thinking as we read the words of Psalm 90. So now go back to Psalm 90, verse 1. Psalm 90, verse 1. It says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. So, Immediately, we see the, the faith and the assurance of Moses as he prays to the Lord, identifying God as a resting place. You see that there? You have been our dwelling place, our refuge, our secure dwelling for all generations, Moses writes. Now, it's one thing to just read that sentence generally as you're doing your psalm study, reading a chapter a day. There's Psalm 90, and you read that, that phrase, you are our resting place. It's another thing to think about it from Moses' perspective as a homeless desert wanderer. And then here, God, you are our resting place, our dwelling, our security. That context helps us. Charles Spurgeon describes this verse this way. He says, the Israelites were very much exposed to all kinds of noxious creatures owing to their uh, residing in tents and their habits of wandering. At one time, the fiery serpent was their foe. By night, the wild beasts prowled around them. Unless that fiery pillar had been a wall of fire around them and glory in the midst, they might all have fallen prey to the wild monsters that roamed the deserts. Worse foes they found in humankind. The Amalekites rushed down from the mountains. Wild wandering hordes constantly attacked them. They never felt themselves secure, for they were travelers through an enemy's country. They were hasting across a land where they were not wanted to another land that was providing means to oppose them when they should arrive, end quote. So this is the, the context of Moses' day. And, and though this is the case for Israel in those days, Moses is still able to see and believe the truth that God is and has been their resting place, their dwelling through it all. He has been the safe haven for generations of Israelites, a homeless, wandering people. Moses continues, speaking about who the Lord is. Verse 2. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Now remember, Moses was God's unique servant and, and prophet. The beginning of the psalm even describes him simply as the man of God, right? Moses, the man of God. That's a high title. Moses was special. He was unique. He was the one whom God spoke with face to face. He's the one whom God gave the law. He's the one God called to lead his people, his nation. And he's the one who was chosen to write the first five books of the Bible, right? The Pentateuch, including the creation narrative. Moses wrote that. And so Moses had great insight into God's original creation and design of the cosmos, and he prayerfully expresses that here, identifying God as the eternal one, from everlasting to everlasting. Right? Moses understands that very well. God is the only uncaused cause. He is the only eternal being there has ever been or ever will be. God is the immovable prerequisite to all that exists. I like the way R.C. Sproul is fond of putting it. He says, if there had ever been a time when nothing existed, nothing could possibly exist now. Chew on that. Chew on that. If there were ever a time when nothing had existed, it would logically follow that nothing could possibly exist now. Moses understands and glorifies God for being the eternal one, right? He has always been, and yet at the same time, 
He's also very aware of the fact that human beings are utterly not eternal. Right? We see that in the next passage, verse 3. You return man to dust and say, return, O children of man. How many times in Numbers 14 did we read? You will die in this wilderness. You will return to dust. Again, this is the, the author who penned the words of Genesis 1 and 2, Moses, that from the ground God formed Adam and breathed the breath of life into his lungs. And as Moses looks around in his day at Adam's rebellious offspring dying and, and being buried one after another for their sinful rebellion, he's all too aware of the fact that dust we are and to dust we shall return. Moses gets that. And it's all in accordance with the will of the sovereign Lord. Life and death operate on God's timetable as we see in the next couple of verses. Look at verse 4. Psalm 90 verse 4. For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past or as a watch in the night. So this eternal God, Moses is praying to exists outside of space and time, right? So, so a thousand years to us is as a day to him. Centuries and millennia come and go, yet God is immovable, unfazed through it all. He is sovereign over it all. Verse 5, you sweep them away as with a flood. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning, it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening, it fades and withers. So Moses draws in the, the, the imagery of nature here as he describes the finite nature of mankind. He uses word pictures of nature here to describe that. God has the power to sweep human beings away as with a flood. Okay, you see that there in verse 5 and 6. So this word picture hits home for me in a unique way. Um, it's, it's not been too long that my family has lived in the country with a couple creeks behind our house. Some of you know we endured a little bit of flooding last summer. Um, we did survive. We made it. It was okay. But we did have a, a wet basement there for a while. Um, but I will never forget just how easy it was for those waters to pick up and move a giant bridge I had built across our creek. If you've been to our house, you know the bridge I'm talking about, right? It, it, I, I worked on it for a couple of months, and it was there, and it was secure, I thought. But then when those waters came, up comes the bridge, and across the yard it goes, right? And, and you think, how is this possible, right? The, the second bridge, the 2.0, is bolted down, so we're okay. Um, but it... it, it just shows you that, that the fl if the flood waters want it, they're going to take it. Okay, that's the point. If the flood waters want it, they're going to take it. Okay, and, and we see that imagery here. You sweep them away as with a flood. Okay, you, you, they, they are like a dream is the next illustration he uses. How, how often do you really remember the details of the dream you had last night? Sometimes you do, but most of the time it's vague right? It's foggy. It, it's swept away. And then the other illustration of grass, right? It's green and healthy first thing in the morning, right? It's wet with the dew. It's flourishing in the morning, but by afternoon or evening, especially on these hot days, it's dry. It's withered, right? So too, according to Moses, are people in comparison to the eternal God, Right? We wither, we fade away. And why is this the case? Why is it this way for humanity? Right? Moses tells us in the next verses. Look at verse 7. For we are brought to an end by your anger. By your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. Okay, so why are we swept away so easily? 
right, into death? Why are we like a fading dream or the withering grass? Well, it's directly connected to God's wrath upon us because of our sin, Moses says. It's our sin that has destroyed us in this way as human beings. Sin and death go hand in hand. They are inseparable. Right again, Moses was well aware of what God had him write down in Genesis 2. Genesis 2, verse 16, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of the tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, in the day you sin against me and transgress my commands, you shall surely die. You shall surely die die. The Hebrew, it's the same word twice. You shall die, die. You're going to double die (laughs) the day that you sin against me, God says. Sin and death go hand in hand in Scripture. The New Testament affirms this, right? Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is, somebody knows it. What is it, church? The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. James 1.15. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Right? Sin and death go hand in hand. And that's reaffirmed for us in Psalm 90. Right? There's a direct correlation between the two. And we experience both as finite human beings. Right? Moses goes on. Look at verse 9. Verse 9. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70 or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. Again, we see Moses beating this drum of the brevity of life and the surety of death for all of us. Maybe you'll reach 70, he says. If you're, if you're really strong, 80. If you're phenomenally strong, like Miss Dieta, you'll be 91, doing great, right? But inevitably, each one of us one day is going to run out of years. That is a reality for all of us. It, it just comes with the territory of being a descendant of Adam and Eve and living in a fallen world. It comes with it. Then we read in verse 11, who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? It's an interesting verse there. Moses poses a question right in the middle of the psalm here. And he essentially asks, who among us is able to grapple with these Things. Who among us truly understands the power of Almighty God? Who among us bears the correct fear of God in order to properly understand his wrath against sin? I think we could ask ourselves the same question. Do we feel the weight of God's wrath against sin? Do we understand that? Do we consider his power His ability to simply usher each and every one of us into death at the very moment he sees fit. We need to think about that. This is the power of the Almighty God we're dealing with. The maker and sustainer of heaven and earth. We need to feel the impact of who God really is and what he's capable of. Then we come to the the pivotal moment in Psalm 90. Possibly the the key verse, I think it is, in verse 12, right? Because what's the answer in all of this, right? What should we do? Well, verse 12 says, So, teach us to number our days, that we may get a heart of wisdom. Teach us to number our days, that we may get a heart of wisdom. Right, so in light of the reality of God's wrath against our sin the brevity of our human lives. Moses says, Lord, teach us to number our days. Now, what does he mean here? He's not simply saying, help us count up however many days we've lived so far. That's not the question. He's not saying, give us 
Give us insight into your secret will to figure out how many days we have left in our lives. That's not the, that's not the point here. No, Moses is crying out to God in prayer. He's saying, help us to make our days count. Teach us to value. Teach us to number the days that you have given us. Teach us to wisely consider each moment of every day with a full awareness that at any moment you might say, time's up. Right? He's praying that, that God would give him a healthy perspective on life in light of eternity. And he's linking this sort of perspective with true godly wisdom, right? That we might get a heart of wisdom. Now, again, we have to remember the context. Moses was watching his fellow Israelites drop like flies in the desert because of God's judgment against their sin, right? They're here one day, they're gone the next. Another funeral, another funeral, another memorial service, right? This is Moses' day, and, and he was all too familiar with the reality of death. And yet he had the right perspective in associating that death with the power and decree of the sovereign creator, God. So he links the reality of death with the holy fear of God. I think this is right. This is a right assessment of reality, and it's one I think that sometimes we lose sight of these days. I really do. I think this is actually one of the areas where we today struggle as modern Christians. This is what I mean, that, that this sort of numbness to the concept of death plagues us. Unlike Moses, Abraham, David, unlike our ancient descendants of the faith, even unlike our, our relatives and, and descendants of, of recent history, many of us today are incredibly unfamiliar with death. It's rare for us to, to lose a loved one, for, for a lot of us, not all of us, but for, for a lot of us. Many of us haven't really had many near-death experiences personally. Not all of us, but most of us. We live fairly sheltered, buffered in lives, safe, comfortable lives without tons of risk. We just kind of assume the grocery store is going to have plenty for us to pick up, right, to feed our families. We assume that. We assume modern medicine will, will cure just about every disease we can come up with. We assume we're safe as we travel, as we start up our vehicles and just go miles across the country. There are no real threats of danger on a regular basis, right? And this is, this is modern living for the most part. And we praise God for that. Don't get me wrong. We praise God for his provisions in those ways. However, our modern lifestyles have a way of distancing us from the ever so close reality of death. You get what I mean there? Our, our comforts, our luxuries, they, they have a way of making us feel like death is very, very far away. We don't have to interact with it much. We don't have to think about it all that much. The deathbed scene, that's just that intense part of the movies, right? It doesn't really cross our minds much that this might actually be the, the last morning that I'm going to wake up. How often do you have that thought? It might be the last time we gather together this way as a church. This might be the last night you kiss your spouse and your kids good night that that was actually the last time you'll speak to your family member that that was the last summer vacation you'll ever take right we, we we just don't think in these terms very often and my point is our modern comforts though we praise god for every one of them can sometimes distance us from the reality of death and the reality of death gives us a proper fear of god we need to be aware of death. We need to have it in our minds that this very well could be my last day and what am I going to do with it, right? It's so easy for us to lose that sense of urgency and, and seriousness that Psalm 90 is teaching us and calling us to. And so like Moses, it's good and right for us to be reminded that we are finite. We are finite creatures. Death is around the corner for each one of us, sure, you may live. You may have 
60 years left. You may have 30. You may have 10. You may have two. We don't know. We don't know. So we must keep watch over our days and our weeks and our months and our years, right? And what does this look like? Well, do we just, do we just throw up our hands and say, well, well what's the point then? What's, what's the point? Right? It can be tempting sometimes for us to get discouraged and, and fearful and just say, forget it. What's, what's the point in any of it? It's all vanity anyway. Or do we just isolate ourselves right, and just live to, to protect ourselves? Kind of the doomsday approach, right? And every, every second is frantically trying to preserve our physical lives. We have to ask ourselves, are either of these the right approach? Are these the approach from a heart of wisdom. No, I don't think they are. Our aim should be to make our lives count with the sober yet joyful realization that eternity is around the corner for all of us. Eternity is around the corner for all of us. We want to live quorum deo. You hear that phrase sometimes, right? That The Latin phrase meaning to, to live one's entire life before God, in the presence of God, under the authority of God. That's what it means to, to number our days with a heart of wisdom. Two quick quotes from church history on this verse, on this passage in uh, chapter 90, verse 12. 17th century minister Matthew Henry, he writes this on this passage. We must live under a constant apprehension of the shortness and uncertainty of life and the near approach of death and eternity, we must so number our days as to compare our work with them and mind it accordingly with a double diligence as those who have no time to trifle. Kids, that means fool around, right? That's Matthew Henry. Theologian John Calvin said it this way. No man then can regulate his life with a settled mind, but he who, knowing the end of it, that is to say death itself, but he who is led to consider the great purpose of man's existence in this world, that he may aspire after the prize of the heavenly calling. I think these men are, are grasping what Moses means for us to, to number our days. It's a weighty matter. There's a seriousness here. And the reality is, if, we, if it weren't for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we might be tempted to, to take those other two approaches I mentioned before of how we deal with the, 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 um, the brevity of, of human life, right? We might get discouraged and, and wipe our hands of it and say, what, what is the point? We would be frantically numbering our days, right, in an effort to, to hurry up and earn God's favor and, and mercy, right? But we truly wouldn't have a reason, if it weren't for Christ, to look forward to eternity, right? Because of, apart from Christ and his atoning work on the cross, physical death would automatically mean spiritual death and separation from God forever. And it's what we all deserve, because we are no better than Israel in the desert. That is so us. <laughs> it's so us. We would surely die, but by the grace of God, but by the grace of God in Christ, that the sinless God-man has come to take away our sin and our shame. And not only that, but to bless us with the gift of salvation and eternal life beyond this life. Right? That's what we have now in Christ. We possess that today if you are in him. And so we can joyfully anticipate that. Through repentance of faith in Christ, his story becomes ours. Now think about this. Think about this great exchange. His story becomes ours his righteousness is applied to us. It's as though you perfectly obeyed the law. Think about that. It's as though you fulfilled every requirement of the law of God. 
His righteousness becomes ours. Our sinfulness becomes his. And he bears the weight of all of it on the cross so that his righteous and eternal reward becomes ours as well. That's the gospel. That's what we live for. That's what gives us hope as we depart from this life into the next. This changes everything about how we view this life. We live it in light of our glorious eternal hope, which rests in the person of Jesus Christ. Amen, somebody. It rests in Christ. We have hope for eternity. And that eternity is around the corner for us. Let's look at verse 13. Verse 13. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. This is the good part. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us and for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. What a request Moses has. What a bold prayer to ask these things. For, for all the pain and suffering Moses and Israel have endured in the desert, for all the hardships they faced, both outward enemies and inward sin, right? Moses is praying that God, as their dwelling place, would comfort them and grant them the gift of gladness. He's praying to be happier. <laughs> Do you know you can pray that? God, make me glad. Make me satisfied in you. And this perfectly aligns with Psalm 16 from a few weeks ago. If you remember, right? We, we, we learned there that the fullness of joy is in God's presence. It's nowhere else. It's in God's presence presence and the the oceans of abundant pleasures are where they're at God's right hand he's a God of joy he's a happy God and I think this is this is a fundamental idea that we have to be reminded of that that God does not want to <laughs> he wants us to be joyful he wants us to be glad only God can satisfy us. He's not trying to spoil your fun. He wants you to be glad in Him. Only God can truly and fully make us joyful. Sure, we might enjoy cheap pleasures and thrills from time to time through things that He's created. But true and fulfilling gladness will only be experienced in and through a relationship with him. That's why sin is such a cheap imitation. <laughs> sin is a cheap imitation of joy. That's why you have to keep going back for more every time. Because it doesn't satisfy, does it? It doesn't satisfy. It's like, like stuffing yourself full of junk food, right? You make yourself sick trying to satisfy those cravings. Cravings that, that McDonald's and candy bars just can't fulfill. Right? <laughs> don't, don't settle for that. God wants you to eat perfectly seasoned grilled steak. Right? right? And, and you're settling for a bag of chips. Don't do that. God has better for you. Moses is teaching us that, yes, though, though our days in this life will be difficult and often full of tragedy and sorrow and pain, there's a way to persevere in and through this life that's actually full of deep gladness and joy in God. But these things will only come in God. And it's the recognition of these things that, that should permeate our minds and our hearts as we number our days and live fully quorum Deo before the Lord in his presence. Right? This is the awareness, the perspective that should fuel us every morning. Right? A quick note of application saints this is why this is why it's so important for us to be unwavering in our commitment to getting alone with God every day getting alone with God every day 
at some point in the day, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prefer the first thing in the morning if you're able, right? Before you've checked your phone, before you're awake enough to, to panic about your to-do list, right? Before you make the kids food, they'll be all right, right? Before you reply to those emails or any of those normal good things, get alone with God. Be glad in God. Hear from your Lord. We saw it this last Sunday in Mark 1. If Jesus can find Devo time, <laughs> and, and, and he seems to need it, right? Who are we to think, ah, maybe once a week I'll, I'll read my Bible. What? Get alone with God. Be with him. Hear from him. And, and be glad in him, right? Verse 14, satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. I really believe it's no coincidence that our, our problems feel bigger and the traffic feels slower and we're just more annoyed when we haven't been with God in a while. Is that, is that just me? Anybody else? Right? It's true that our anxieties, they, they rise and they, they weigh us down Yet when we get with God, and we spend time in his word and time in prayer, it's amazing how, how that solves some problems, doesn't it? It's not that, that big a deal. <laughs> I just, I'll just prioritize it and we'll get it done, but, but I've been with the Lord of glory today. And I have eternity around the corner. I've been, I've been properly oriented to the rest of life. I'm not saying it's going to look perfect every day, right? It doesn't have to be this perfect, perfect, uninterrupted 30 minutes, 5 a.m., or anything like that. But you, you know, you know when you've been with God. You know, uh, one pastor said, pray until you've prayed. You know what I mean there? <laughs> pray until you've prayed. You, you know when you've prayed. You know when you've said some words, but then you also know when you've prayed. When, you've, when God has heard you and you have, you have gone to him with your burdens and your cares, you leave different. You just do. That's because you've been with God. He is satisfying you in the morning with his steadfast love that's being applied as we go about this, right? And this treasure, this gift of his presence, isn't just, it's not just for private individual devotions either. It's for families. It's for communities, Right? Look at verse 16. Look at verse 16. We're almost done. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Right? This implies community. So we need to be reflecting on the glorious works and power of God, not only as individuals, but as families and as communities together. Meditating on who God is and all that he's done is a community project. Right? And it should be passed down to the next generation. Our children don't just need to be taught biblical content. Yes, they do need to be taught biblical content, but it's not just that. They need to see and witness their parents and their aunts and uncles and grandparents enjoying and experiencing God in real time, in person. They need to see that. They need to see you get excited as you read them that story of God delivering Israel from, from Pharaoh. They need to see par parents tear up as the word of God cuts them to the heart. They need to see their pastors preaching their guts out up here about how awesome the Lord is. They need to see that. And they need to hear adults in the local church singing at the top of their lungs the truths of God, the beauties, the works of God. Our kids need that. And all of these are ways that we display the glories of God to the next generation. And the beauty is that as we pursue him, we are changed and transformed from one degree of glory to another. Right? We're transformed. God grants us peace as we behold him through his word and in prayer, becoming more like him. And saints, when we fail to guard that, that regular diet of, of nourishment, that regular time of being in the presence of God, we should not be surprised when our souls feel 
depleted and starved and frail. We should not be surprised. Do you want more gladness in your life? Anybody? <laughs> I do. Be with God. Be with God. Finally, let's look at verse 17. Verse 17. Moses closes on a request for God's blessing. Verse 17. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. This reminded me of Psalm 1, right, where the psalmist, he describes the blessed, the happy man, right, to be one who meditates on God and his word day and night. We know this from Psalm 1. And then verse 3, he is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Right? This is Psalm 1. So again, we see this correlation between God's word producing joy and peace and gladness. But not only that, God's presence and word create productivity. <laughs> they create productivity. Effective work comes from and through those who are anchored in the Lord. Moses is saying that though our world is fallen and our days are brief in this life, we ask you, Lord, to prosper the work of our hands and make us effective instruments for your glory. So it's right and good. It's right and good for us to be hardworking, productive plotters in the work God has called us to. That's a good thing. It's not meaningless so long as we do it from the right perspective, right? We should not roll out of bed and stumble our way into school or work every morning just so we can hurry up and get to the weekend. That's a bad strategy. It's a depressing way to live, right? We should not be miserably going through the motions of life, counting down the seconds until vacation, until the weekend, until retirement, right? Those, those things are good in and of themselves, but that's not why we do what we do. It's not our motivation, right? We want to aim higher than that. <laughs> we want to pray like Moses that God would prosper the actual work of our hands and establish our efforts to make a difference for him. In short, we want to bring him glory in what we do and the way in which we go about that, right? We want to do it from a heart posture of gladness and satisfaction in him. So as we close things up for tonight, I want to I want to give us another quote from Spurgeon. Okay, this will be the last last quote um, again on this passage of Psalm 90. Remember how at the beginning he gave the context of Moses' day, Israel wandering in the desert, and the the wild beasts that would attack this homeless nation, and the wicked enemies that they had to face. Right, the dark picture of that context. Well, that same quote continues, and Spurgeon says. Such is the Christian. He is journeying through an enemy's land. Every day he is exposed to danger. His tent may be broken down by death. The slanderer is behind him. The open foeman is before him. The wild beast that prowls by night and the pestilence that wasteth by day continually seek his destruction. He finds no rest where he is. He feels himself exposed. Is that not our experience to some extent in this life? But, says Moses, though we live in a tent exposed to wild beasts and fierce men, yet thou art our inhabitation. In thee we find no exposure. Within thee we find ourselves secure, and in thy glorious person we dwell as an impregnable tower of defense, safe from every fear and alarm, knowing that we are secure. This is the Christian life. Church family, no matter what you're going through in this current season, whether it's joys or sorrows or gladness or pain, I pray that we would all rest in God as our dwelling place and number our days with a heart of wisdom. We do not know how long we have left. We just don't. 
but we know that because of Christ, our eternal state will be full of unspeakable joy in God's presence forevermore. So in the meantime, may we cry out to God daily to satisfy us in the morning with his steadfast love and fill our hearts with peace and gladness as we pursue him. Amen.